anything you could ever dream or plan up for yourself. And uh, they are great plans. And uh, I pray that today our hearts would be such as that we would say, God, whatever it is that you have for me today, uh, would you do it? Would you do it in my heart? And uh, I know that uh, he has something for you. And I pray that this uh, text will be a blessing to you. And I pray that as we take a look at this emotion, uh, that would be a, a, a checkup, that would be a great look into our lives, and that we'd be honest with ourselves. And uh, we'd say, hey, God, do a work in us this morning. Take your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 37. Uh, Genesis chapter number 37. Envy. Let's say that word together. Envy. How many of you know what envy means? How many of you would say, I struggle with envy? You don't have to slip your hand up there. Because the truth is, when we're envious, it really does feel a little bit immature. It feels a little bit embarrassing. I don't know that I've ever walked up to somebody in sincerity and said, I'm so envious of you. Now I'll tell somebody, hey, I'm mad at you. I'm disappointed in you. I'm sad because of you. I don't know that I've ever walked up to somebody and said, man, I really envy you. Envy is something that's typically kept within our hearts. Envy is when uh, we're out fishing and uh, we're pulling our little John boat in and the guy pulls up with the $100,000 boat next to us with all the bells and the whistles and the fish begin to jump in his boat while he's at the dock. Yeah. And he's sitting there sipping on his drink and soaking up the rays, wearing his $500 sunglasses, listening to his super duper uh, satellite radio. Envy is when you look at that and look at your John boat and look back at that boat. That feeling, that's envy. Some of us will look at somebody like that. We'll think to ourselves, he's, he's flaunting his wealth. Well, I bet you this, I bet you he doesn't give to his church, right? That's the way our minds work. He's all showy with his money. That's, that's envy. What happens is envy allows us to make somebody who ought not be our rival. And envy is very dangerous to our souls because it doesn't, it doesn't leave quickly. We fixate on it. Envy is when you have something, and I feel that I deserve it as much or more than you do. And all of a sudden, you have become, without my even realizing it or purposing to let it be, you have become my emotional envy. And if we're all very honest with ourselves this morning, we are all envious over different things. Be really honest. Uh, the boat thing for me isn't my deal. To be honest, I look at that $100,000 boat and I think, I don't want to wash that thing. I don't want to keep it clean. I'm like, a John boat, spray it off, throw it in the back of the truck, I'm good to go. I don't want to spend the time or the money that you put into that boat. That's just not my thing. And so for those of you with nice boats, you can relax. Uh, boats don't really do it for me. But if I can just be really, really honest with you, here's something that God's dealt with me about. And I want to be just very candid because I want, to, I want you to see that it is something that we all struggle with. Uh, to me, comparison is a great, a great enemy of mine. And I have a tendency to get envious of, for example, other ministries. You say, Jonathan, you're a horrible pastor. I probably am. But it's very difficult to sit down and you listen to somebody saying, man... You should see the amazing miracles that are happening in our church. You, you should see how God is just providing all of the money for this multi-million dollar project. I should be rejoicing with them. But when they begin to talk about how smooth and so great and how, how awesome things are going, I think to myself, man, I wish I could ride that wave with you. I wish I could experience some of that smooth sailing for a moment. Are you with me? As we look on the back, uh, as we look back on just the six, seven months of this year, man, it's been a pretty hectic year, hasn't it? Had a lot of stuff going on. 
If I'm not careful, I get online and I see the Sunday morning highlights and I click through and I scroll through. And we just came through a month where our lowest attendance in two years on Sunday mornings. And I'm not going to get on and post about, hey, uh, we just had a great Sunday. Lowest attendance four Sundays in a row, right? Nobody wants to brag about that. If I'm not careful, I can look at someone else's success and I can be envious of that. The truth is this, I should rejoice where the gospels preach. I, I should rejoice where God is doing great works. I should, I should rejoice at the success of others. I should rejoice when others are able to go uh, without trial. I should rejoice at that. And by the way, by the way, let me just pause for a moment. Uh, the paradigm is flawed because you don't live a day in their shoes and you don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know the difficulty. You don't know, in my case, the counseling appointments or, or the adversity or the emotional or physical strain and stress that places all I see is the highlight and I say man I'm envious of that I don't know if you can relate to me in that but a lot of times I unconsciously or subconsciously create rivals emotional enemies in my heart and God's been doing a work in me even as I've been preparing this message. And the truth is, it feels like God has been doing a little bit of a, a bypass in my life. And as some of us this morning, it's time for us to take a look at our life and be honest with ourselves. If envy lives there, that is emotion that has no place. If you've ever envied somebody's car or house or Maybe their physique, can I get a witness right there? <laughs> Marriage or children, grandchildren, business, boat, salary, education, uh, temperament, athletic ability, character, uh, just anything about them. If I were to ask you all that list of things and say, have, has that ever been you and ask you to raise your hand? Uh, I have a feeling if we're honest, every one of us would raise our hands. So welcome this morning to Club Envy. <laughs> Club Envy is all over this place. Envy is universal, but here's the deal. If it goes unchecked, it can ruin your life. It's a serious sin. Envy makes people do evil things. And Satan uses envy to have... Uh, to you, uh, Satan uses envy uh, to have people step away uh, from God. Envy is a, a, a very dangerous, dangerous thing. Some of you that are a little older, you may remember a woman named Tanya Harding. Anybody remember Tanya Harding? She's a professional figure skater. And uh, she began to work her way up in the skating ranks uh, mid to late 1980s. Uh, she won her first uh, triple axle, uh, or she landed the, uh, her, the first triple axle in competition at the U.S. Championships. Uh, she won the title uh, with the first 6.0 that was ever given to female figure skaters uh, for technical merit at that event and uh, had many other successes. You say, Jonathan, why do you know these things? When I was growing up, uh, it was me and then two sisters for a long time. And I wanted to watch sports, and they wanted to watch figure skating. And I ended up watching a lot of figure skating. And uh, so Tanya Harding was a name that I heard much. But Tanya Harding became jealous of her competitors. And if you remember, she, had, she drove eight, 900 miles uh, to, uh, to meet with Nancy Kerrigan, uh, who was a competitor of hers, and uh, she attacked her uh, because of the envy, the competition that she had in her heart. And that's why I don't figure skate. It's a very dangerous sport. <laughs> that's envy gone violent. But can I, can I be very honest this morning, and, and this is all kind of leading up to our our text here in Genesis 37, we've got to understand what envy does. We've got to understand if we allow this emotion of envy to reign in our hearts, it, it has some devastating consequences. And if I could just name a few, it keeps our current and also potential relationships from growing. Envy tends to make us judge other people's motives. Envy hurts innocent people. Envy reveals the condition of our hearts. 
Envy is sinful. It has serious consequences. Envy unchecked leads to anxiety in our lives. It causes you, if you're very honest with yourself, to lose enjoyment in life. Envy also breaks the 10th commandment. Exodus 20, 17 tells us, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So, so what's the bottom line here? And if I can just put it to you this way, envy and joy cannot coexist in the same heart. Envy and joy cannot coexist in the same heart. You can't be envious and also live a happy life. It is impossible. Now, no one's immune from the emotion of envy, but I want you to see uh, that you can check it, uh, that you can be immune from bitterness and resentment and emptiness that accompany envy. Uh, you can break envy's control over your life. And so this morning, I want us to take a look at Genesis 37, uh, the life of Joseph. Now, we see uh, the life of Joseph, and we're familiar uh, with this story, so I'll not read uh, every single uh, uh, verse in this chapter. I'll assume that you're familiar uh, with the story of Joseph. If you're not as familiar with it, uh, as you'd like to be, I'd encourage you to take a look through the book of Genesis and catch up. And uh, you will find a great, great story of adversity and overcoming adversity. But to be very honest, you will find a story that began uh, with unchecked envy. And if you look in verse number 3 there, I want to kind of set the stage for us. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children... Because he was the son of his old age. Now let's stop for a moment and let's be really honest with ourselves. We just by reading that verse there are set up for a giant problem. We've got a breeding ground for envy. Jacob, Israel here, loves Joseph more than all the other brothers. But not only does he have a favorite son and kind of keep it to himself, he's told others that Joseph is his favorite. Uh, that's probably uh, not a good idea. Uh, probably two words that Jacob could use. Uh, parenting class, right? You're not supposed to have <laughs> favorites. Uh, but Joseph here is Jacob's favorite. The verse continues in verse number three. And he made him a coat of many colors. So the favoritism is now a front and center. He gives him a robe. And we think to ourselves, what's the big deal? A robe? I mean, what's, what's the big deal about that? Joseph's robe in that day would have been more common apparel uh, or, or more commonly worn, however. Uh, it was stunning. It was hand-tailored. Uh, it would have been a designer clothing. But here's the important part. The brothers didn't get one. Are you with me? You say to yourself, well, I don't really care about a robe, and many colors isn't really my style, especially uh, down in St. Petersburg, right? Not really feeling like we're wearing a rainbow robe around Benelis. That really doesn't uh, do it for me. Uh, robes might not be your thing, but have you ever been around somebody, and they're giving something to someone, and you don't even care what it is. It's just the fact they didn't give you one. Yeah? It's like when your mom, when you were a kid, and your mom was... Uh, had just a little bit of something left and said, who wants it? You didn't even care what it was. I just want it because it's the last there is, right? You don't want uh, somebody else to be the favorite. But this robe was special. It was valued. It was an expression of the father's love. In that culture, it was an expression of status. It was in your face, raw favoritism. And every time Joseph wore this robe, it had to have turned the knife in his brothers a little bit deeper. Do you think Joseph probably wore this robe a lot? I think he never took it off. Yeah. That robe communicated to his brothers, you're, you're not the favorite. You're, you're second best. <laughs> na 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 boo boo, right? Watch this now. Envy starts with mild je jealousy. And left unchecked, it becomes a tsunami. And Joseph's brothers allowed this to go unchecked. Uh, sure, it was a legitimate feeling, that feeling of, of sadness or that feeling of, 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 uh, of uh, 
disapproval that they had, but they allowed it to be unchecked and it it, it, it snowballed into something much, much greater and more dangerous. So how do we capture jealousy? How do we diffuse it so it doesn't turn into envy and turn ugly like what we see in verse number 4? Look in the, uh, our passage again, if you would. When his brethren saw that their brother loved him, uh, or their father loved him more than all his brethren, they, what's the word? They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, the truth is the brothers resented Joseph, but their issue should have been more with Jacob than it was Joseph. But, but they hated Joseph. They were angry with, with Joseph. And they, they grew so angry at Joseph that they couldn't speak a kind word to him. They couldn't even fake it. They couldn't even, even pretend. I mean, they had nothing good to say to him. And that's how envy works. Envy distracts us from the real issue. Envy goes to, to blame when, when we should be looking inside. It causes you to blame the wrong person or the wrong thing. Now, the brothers wanted dad's love. And I, I don't think it was as much about the coat as it was the, the feelings behind the coat. They wanted his acceptance. Who doesn't want their, their dad to love them as much as the rest of their siblings? Are you, are you following what I'm saying there? But here's what envy does. Envy clouds perspective. And envy turns friends into enemies. When you get to a place where you think of someone as your rival and you don't even want to say a kind word to them, listen, envy, envy. Can I be just really honest to where this message came from? And I, I'm going to be very candid. And I, I, if you hate me, you can hate me. This week I was in uh, Kentucky for my grandmother's uh, my grandmother's funeral. And as I was in Kentucky for my grandmother's funeral, uh, my sister Donna was able to come in. My sister Andy, I've not seen him in seven years. He was able to come in. And it was really good to see him. My sister Danae got laid up in the airport in, uh, in Las Vegas, delayed like five hours, wasn't able to make it. Now I wasn't able to see Austin. But Dana or Donna and Andy and I were there. And as we're at the funeral in Kentucky, everybody in the county comes by the funeral home. I mean, everybody, it's a small county, 3,000 people or so. And I mean, everybody's, uh, get that, 3,000 people, all right? About the same size as Pinellas, 3,000, 1 million. I grew up very country, all right? And uh, people are coming by the funeral home. And I went and I stood by dad because I'm the, I'm the eldest son. I'm the, I'm the first child to have the name Redford. I mean, that's me, firstborn favorite. Should be. Best looking, most talented, I mean, all of these things. <laughs> My brothers both grew this way and I grew this way. It was really unfair, but I'm standing there by my dad, and uh, my dad tends to have kind of a one track mind. And uh, so people come up and they're talking to dad, and uh, dad didn't, didn't acknowledge that I was there and introduced me. And I started just kind of getting a little just perturbed, bothered me. And Shouldn't have bothered me. This is his mom, and he's, he hasn't seen some of these people in years. But it bothered me. That just led kind of. But what really set it to the top is later on at the end of the night, there's just two people left, and we're talking. And uh, Dad starts going through. They say, so who's this crew? And Dad starts going in line. He says, this is my daughter, and she lives in Ohio, And this is my blah, blah, blah. And this is my stepdaughter, and this is my stepson. And he gets around to me, and he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say a thing. Now, mind you, two people before me was my stepsister, and uh, he introduced my stepsister. He's been married uh, to her mother for 15 years, and so really he's, he's the dad that they've known for all their life as they've grown up and things like that. And he made the statement, he made the statement, and I'm just kind of publishing my feelings here, so just uh, understand where I'm going here. He said, uh, this, is, this is my stepdaughter, Keely. He said, I've raised her like my own. And I felt as though somebody had grabbed a knife and just stuck it in me and stuck it and stuck it. Because I'm thinking, I am your own and you didn't raise me. I'm thinking about the nights that I spent waiting for. And I just. And so by the time he got around to me and didn't say my name, I'm seething. I mean, I am seething. 
And just to be really, really honest, I am so envious of my stepsister that I can barely see straight because of the hurt I felt in my heart. So I sit there for five minutes, and they continue a conversation. And finally I say, and by the way, I'm his oldest. And I, seriously, I made a, made a little bit. It, it wasn't, I wasn't being rude, but I was very much being dramatic. And I totally had a little thing there. I'm his oldest. He forgot about me, blah, 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 blah. And I introduced myself and all this. It, it wasn't, it was fun, a bit laugh and all this stuff. But I walked away, and inside my heart, there was no laughing. So the next day, we're at the funeral itself, and... Just some little things. And I, I am looking at all the pictures of my grandmother uh, with all my step-siblings. And mind you, I love my step-siblings. I really legitimately do. Like, I really, really do. I love my stepmom. She's an awesome person. But I'm angry. And I'm envious. And here's the way it took place. I began to look at them as, I hate them. And so I get in the truck and I'm driving home and I am just going to town on my dad. My brother's with me, my brother who I haven't seen in seven years, my brother who I need to be talking about other things with, and I'm just pouring out all this vitriol. How dare you follow what I'm saying? And somebody who shouldn't be my enemy becomes my enemy because I'm feeling envy. And about halfway home, uh, home, everywhere you go in Kentucky is like 30 minutes, but like here it's 30 minutes, three miles. There it's like 30 minutes, 40 miles. Like it's, it's spread out. And so we're driving home, we're halfway home. And it's like the Spirit of God just breaks into my pity party and says, are you done yet? Like, legit, are you done yet? Like, there's this pastor that's preaching a series on emotion. You should check it out because you're sure operating in a lot of emotion right now. And it's like for a moment I paused and I'm like, man, my brother needs me to be speaking truth into his life right now. My brother's struggling with enough stuff right now. And one of his things is he hates critical Christians. And here I am just going ham. It's like the Spirit of God, are you done yet? And so this weekend I was planning on preaching another message. But to be honest, I needed this message this week. Why? Because envy, when you don't check it. It leads you to places that you should never be. Now, I had to get that thing right with God. I had to get it right with my brother. I went to my stepmother the morning I left, and I said, I want you to know that I'm very sorry because I have had so much bitterness against you over the last couple of days that should not be there, that you did not cause, and I am so very sorry. And she said, you feel jealous, don't you? And I said, yeah. And she said, I completely understand. But here's a person that had become my enemy because I was allowing my emotion to rule me. Can you take your Bibles back to Genesis 37 and verse number 5? Genesis 37 and verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream. He told it his brethren. They hated him yet the more. He said unto them, Here I pray you the dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And yet they hated him, yet the more for his dreams and for his words. The picture him here, the favored one. Guys, you got to hear the dream that I had. Man, I dreamed this dream, and you guys were all in it, and you're going to serve me one day, and I'm going to be in charge, and you're going to be obedient to me. Isn't that great? Aren't you happy for me? One day you're going to bow down to me. <laughs> and the brothers hated him yet the more. And they hated him so much that their envy turned to beginning to plot how they could take him out. Verse number 18, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. 
And here's the point. When you're envious, you don't see the total picture. When you're envious, you, you have resentment uh, that builds to the, to the point of you think things that should never be thought. And they wanted to kill Joseph. And they refused to believe that God was leading him. And some of you are thinking, oh, okay, Jonathan, that was, that was the biblical area back then. They wanted to kill him. There was a lot more murder. This is 21st century, and we live in, in Largo. We're, we're more educated. Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm envious of so-and-so, but I'd never want to kill that person. Really? You know, the reality is you, me, were one bad decision from being on the front page of the Tampa Bay Times. We're one decision away. You say, well, I would never murder someone. Well, how about murdering their reputation? (laughs) How about using your words to tear them down behind their back because you're envious of them? How about stirring up dissension and How about killing your marriage because you can't forgive? Well, everybody likes them and nobody likes me. And so I'm going to, I'm going to hate them because envy can ride a quick escalator to turning into anger and hatred and revenge and destruction. And they got to a point where they wanted to kill him. Verse number 19, they said to one another, behold, this dreamer cometh. They don't say Joseph's coming. They say the dreamer. When you, when you envy somebody, you tend to reduce them uh, to a term. You, you depersonalize them. They, they are no longer a son or a daughter or a friend or a brother or a sister. Here comes that visionary. Here comes that dreamer. Here comes that busybody. Here comes that rich kid. Here comes that. Are you following what I'm saying? In verse number 23 to verse number 28, it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it, and they sat down to eat bread. They lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, uh, their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh. They are going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, Hey, guys, all right, listen. What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Because they had thought to slay him, right? You say, well, they kind of softened up. They just sewed him into slavery. No, no, no. They decided they would not gain from killing him, but they could gain by selling him into slavery. There was no love there. It was simply self-interest. What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, (laughs) let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother in our flesh. Uh, let's not kill him. He's our brother, guys. Plus, we get some money for him, right? And his brethren were, what's the word? Content. Content. Then there passed by Midianite merchantmen, and they lifted up and drew Joseph out of the pit. They sold uh, Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. They brought Joseph into Egypt, and their envy fell short of murder, but it was probably for their own self-interest. They, they definitely sought to destroy him, and that's what envy does. Envy seeks to destroy. If they couldn't have the robe, they didn't want anybody else to have it either. And they get rid of him. And they go in verse number 31. They took Joseph's coat, and they killed a kid of the goats. They dipped the coat in the blood. They sent the coat of many colors, brought it to their father, and said, This we have found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent into pieces. Interesting who is being deceived right now. Jacob the deceiver. He had deceived in the past. He had sold part of his brother's inheritance. But he is now being deceived. And there's a whole story and lesson uh, there. But verse number 34, look at Jacob's response to this. And Jacob rent his clothes and put his sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. This is the irony of this story. You ready? When they finally got the rival out of the way. 
They finally had their father's attention solely to themselves. Guess where their father's attention was? <laughs> Still on Joseph. Joseph is gone. And yet, they cannot comfort him. He does not move past this like David with the death of he and Bathsheba's son. He is mourning and saying, I will not be comforted. I cannot be comforted. I promise that I will go into the grave unto my son mourning. I am going to spend, the, listen to me, I'm going to spend the rest of my life sorrowing for Joseph. Can I tell you, that's what envy and jealousy always does. It backfires. And he, Jacob's fo focusing all of his emotion, all of his energy on Joseph. That's the emptiness of envy. Envy does not lead the way we wish it would. It always backfires. And what they wanted was for their dad to give them some attention, but now Joseph is gone and their, their dad is depressed. Listen to me. En envy destroys lives. <laughs> it destroys marriages. It destroys churches. Can I go a step further? God hates envy. And God will not bless a life full of envy. And my prayer is, and I've talked to some of you, you said, man, I appreciate the message on this emotion. I appreciate the message on anger. I got a lot of feedback about anger. I'm glad to know that I'm not the only person that struggles with that emotion, right? And I've heard you say, hey, Jonathan, the Lord dealt with my... I believe that if you're here, your heart is that you want the Lord to bless you. Whether you're a regular here or you're here just checking things out, you've come, you want for God to use your life. If I were to conduct a poll and say, do you want God, God's blessings on your life? Chances are you'd say yes. So let's get practical. Let's take some action here. You say, I, I get it. I see the destruction, destructive nature of envy. Can I give you just three thoughts, practical thoughts, that I believe will help you as you battle envy? You, you say, Jonathan, what, what does it matter? What, envy, if you haven't got it yet, envy leads you to a place, by the way, really quickly, that you should not be. But, uh, let me just share my heart with you, because I, and I'm trying to, I hope... I hope that I don't give you this illustration for you to feel sorry for me. I don't give you this, this uh, illustration for you to uh, just because I have to let you into my life. I give you the illustration because I hope that it is a help to you. When I went to Kentucky, I'm sitting on the airplane. My spirit, my heart was in a place of I am going to minister to my family. I've got relatives who are unsaved. I've got a brother who I've not seen in seven years that is really struggling. I'm going to Kentucky. I'm on the plane. I am praying. I am walking in the spirit. I'm reading my Bible. I'm reading great, helpful books. I'm reading books that will strengthen my walk with God. I mean, I am not taking this opportunity lightly. This was no vacation. I went with the heart to minister. And I go and I'm meeting people and I'm ministering and I'm meeting cousins. I've not seen and I'm ministering and I'm loving. And I sit down for five minutes and that takes place. And I go from walking in the spirit to walking in the flesh like that. Understand that this message, it comes from a heart of, hey, listen, our emotion can switch where we're at really quickly if we follow our emotion. You know, you know when I struggle with my emotion, possibly the most, my wife will tell you, Sunday morning before church. Dead serious. Beth Ann, please let's get out the door. Bethany, we have to be on time. Bethany, I'm so uptight. I'm so, I'm just emotionally, and I'm going to worship. I mean, this is, a, I get here in this, like my favorite time of the week, and I love preaching, and I love ministering, and I love you guys, but I'm just, are you following what I'm saying? It is so easy to go from spirit-led to emotion-led, just a decision. So let's look at a couple just practical helps. I hope, I hope these are a help to you. I this message is not as organized as I prayed it would be. It is not as, as uh, it doesn't build on it as much as I hoped it would. But here's a lesson that God has done in my heart this week. I hope it's a blessing to you. Here's, here's how we attack envy. First of all, first of all, acknowledge that it's there. <laughs> acknowledge that it's there. 
See, some of us, we sit in a service like this, and, and I'm sitting here, and I'm telling you about my failures, and I'm, I'm really, it's, it's embarrassing that I handled that situation that way. And you're listening to that, and you're listening to me give an illustration, you're like, I've never thought about somebody else's boat. And I've never, I've never, blah, 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 I've never done this, and I've never done that. And Jonathan, man, I should be a pastor, because that guy's awful. Every week he tells us about what he's preaching, about how he's a failure at that. First of all, you've got to admit you're envious. Maybe the simple question is this, who are you envious of? What are you envious of? Let's start with something simple. <clears throat> Maybe it's your neighbor, and you're envious that on Sundays he gets to stay home, cut his grass, relax, while you feel obligated to go to church. Maybe it's the coworker that you go and you're talking about your weekend. What'd you do? Oh, I went on this vacation again this weekend. And you're like, man, I've got to pay bills. And I've got kids. And I've got this. And, and, and you, don't, you don't hate it, It's not like you hate him, but you really struggle with hearing about how great his weekend was. You guys, that's envy. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's us walking into the grocery store and looking at that super skinny person standing in front of that wall of donuts and just picking and picking and picking and picking. And us like walking by the donuts and looking away because we know if we look at them, we'll put on four pounds. <laughs> it's envy. It's envy. It's that person drives up to church and they have a new vehicle and you're like, well, I bet if they gave more money to missions, they wouldn't be able to afford that. You ever think that maybe it's because they do give money to missions that God has blessed them to be able to do that? Just, just a thought for you. Because the principle is this. Those that honor me, I'll honor. And the, the, the principle is that if we bless, if we allow the Lord to use us and bless others, he blesses us because we're blessing others. So I'm not saying everybody that has a fancy car is a great giver to the church or a great giver to the works of God. I'm just saying we would do well to stop envy. So admitting <laughs> that we have envy. To break free of envy, you've got to admit the ugliness of it. Proverbs chapter number 14, verse 30 says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. So let's just, let's just say that we're all at a point where the Spirit has worked in us and we've said, Hey, I acknowledge it. I'm envious. I hate what it does. I've created a bunch of rivals unintentionally. I, I am torn up inside. I am a prisoner of envy. I acknowledge all of that. What next? Can I tell you, you ought to start with apologizing to God. Apologizing to God. Well, I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. He's forgiven all my sins. We're, me and God are good as these other people that I struggle with. I, I'm talking about saying, I'm sorry, God. Here, here's why. And this, this thought, this thought, just I think it defines envy better than anything else in this message. When we envy, we're saying, God, you've not done me right. God, you're not giving me what I desire. That, that's what envy is. God, your provisions aren't good enough for me. God, I've prayed and you seem silent. You're, you're cheating me out of what I deserve. At the heart of envy, and this is not original to me, but this is a great thought. At the heart of envy is the lie that God owes you. If you'll, if you'll take that and stow that away, that'll help you. At the heart of envy is the lie. God owes me. Henry Blackaby said in his book, The Man God Uses, he says this. A godly person makes no demands of God. Nor does he argue with God. For us to place conditions on how God will use us is arrogant, proud, and rebellious. And it indicates a heart problem. Only total obedience to God. You ready? Here's the condition. No matter what he allows in my life will accomplish his purpose for my life. Let me give you that again. Only total obedience to God, regardless of what he allows in my life, will accomplish his purpose for my life. Listen, I am not here to minimize your heartaches. And I, I'm not here. There is a lot of pain. There is a lot of pain in this room. 
There are a lot of people that are hurting, and some of you are going through very difficult times, and I'm not trying to make them trivial. Some of you feel like God has abandoned you. And listen, if you have those feelings, pray to God. That's where we got Psalms. All right? But the Bible says this, that God has you in his hands, that he knows everything that's going on in your life. As a matter of fact, God says, I know when a sparrow falls to the ground. And in case you don't know, there's a lot of sparrows. He says, the hairs of your head are numbered. Some of us have more than others. That's still a lot of hair. Do you really think that God owes you something? If you're honest with yourself, do you really believe that he's robbing you of something that you don't deserve? Do you really think that not having that nicer house is keeping you back? Do you you really believe that not having that vacation is God cheating you? Here's the perspective that I have about it. Jesus has made it very clear that God's perfect. He's holy. That we're separated because of our sin. And because of our disobedience, the things that we've done wrong, we're separated from God. But God in His grace and in His mercy gave us what we did not deserve. And the price of our pardon was His very own Son. Colossians 2, I think, says it the best that I could ever say it, better than I could ever say it. And this idea of that song we sang, Complete in Thee, earlier, this is is where that is based. Colossians 2.10, And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. By the way, we're talking here about Christ. We are complete in Christ. We are complete because of Christ. We are pardoned because of Christ. We are justified because of Christ. Everything we are, anything we have, anything that we can look at in glory of, it is because of Jesus and Jesus alone. Verse number 12, buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Let me pause a moment. Let's recap that, because that's really good. And you, it's like the proverbial hand of God reaches out of the sky and points and says, and you, just so you remember, you were dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, and you, that's who you are, but you have been quickened, you've been made alive because of Jesus. You've had your sins, all of them, all of your trespasses forgiven. And then verse 14 just picturesquely describes uh, what took place there, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cro- to his cross. Picture this, picture that you and I have this this list of transgressions, this list of accusations, this list of ordinances against us, and we are damned because of them. But Jesus came and his blood blotted out our transgressions. And we that were contrary, those ordinances that that had us uh, diametrically opposed to who God himself was, those ordinances, those trespasses blotted out by the blood of Christ, taken, nailed to the cross. Hey, we who were sinners are sinners no more because of Christ. Sinners now saints because of the blood of Christ. Here's what happens when we get in trouble with envy. Here's what happens. We take our focus off of God and we put it on ourself. And we put it on others. Put it on situations. Facebook post changed my life this week. You might laugh at that, but it changed my life. The the post, it was a, a meme of some sort, and it said, many people when they're asked how they would spend their last day, they say, we would do this, and they would list that trip that they've never taken. They would list their favorite food, they would list their favorite activity, they would list whatever their favorite was. And, and the meme said something to the effect that, that reveals everything about us. Because Jesus is the one who actually knew when his last day was. And when he knew it was his last day, he washed the feet of others. I want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus spent the last day of his life serving those, you ready, who would betray
Here's when envy comes. I, I deserve that. And they got it. I've been going through a rough patch lately. I can barely keep the lights on. And here they are buying a new car. See, your problem, truthfully, is not with them and their new car. Your problem is you think that God is shafting you. That God is ripping you off. That you deserve something and God's holding out on you. I, I don't envy people that have a vehicle that's 10 years older than mine. That looks really bad. Are you following what I'm saying? So what we're saying is, God, you've not been good enough for us. Thus, we have to... Em- At the heart of envy is the lie that we deserve something that God's not giving us. Jonathan, what is your point? You're beating this into the ground. The point is this. Our greatest problem in life is our pride. All of our sin, all of our sin... Find it finds its rest in our pride. You look at the way we act out, you look at our anger, you look at our lust, you look at every sin, you trace it back, and ultimately the problem is my view of myself is wrong. I'm placing my view of me above my view of God. I'm placing my happiness above God's happiness. I'm placing my... Secu- are, you, are you following what I'm saying? Everything in our life that's jacked up, every bit of it comes back to my pride. So what are you saying? As long as you live in envy, as long as you're full of pride, you'll always live in envy. The only way to deal with your pride is to empty yourself of it and fill yourself with the Spirit of God. Can I give you... Can I give you just one more thought that I think will really help you? It's helped me. So number one, admit, hey, I struggle with envy. Number two, get a view of yourself that's right. Understand that we need to apologize for God to God sometimes. Hey, some of us, we are so full of ourselves. Apologize to God. Here's number three. Celebrate others. Celebrate others. Well, what's that look like? When they get that new car, instead of walk, driving out the driveway thinking, they don't deserve that. How, how did they? Walk up, hey, I saw that car. That is awesome. So excited for you. When you go over to their house, instead of saying, well, I wish my living... I am so glad that God blessed you with this house. I'm so thankful. And by the way, thank you for using it to invite me over and spend time. Thank you. I'm so happy for you. That, that, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. You've been working at that place for five years, and the little kid who just graduated college has been working there, one, just got the promotion you were gunning for. Instead of cold shouldering him and being envious of him or her and just hating their guts, when, by the way, they didn't give themselves the promotion anyway, somebody else gave it to them, your, your envy is misplaced, by the way, why don't you walk up to him, hey, I am so glad that you got that promotion. You say, well, I'm not going to lie, and I don't feel that. Some of you, some of you need to start operating in what you know, and then the feelings will accompany that. Are you to be envious? No. And some of us, we need to operate in, hey, listen, I'm to rejoice with you. I'm going to be happy for you. I'm going to be excited for you. I'm to celebrate with you. Hey, somebody has success, and you're thinking to yourself, I'm always overlooked for that. Nobody ever sees, hey, no, no, no. I encourage you to pray for them. Pray that God would continue to bless them. And and here's something I'll promise you. When when celebration of others becomes habit for you, envy will not rule and reign in your heart. When celebrating others 
becomes habit to you. Envy will have no place to live within your heart. Some of us, all the devil has to do to get us sidetracked, all he has to do is let off on somebody else. All he has to do is turn our head to somebody else who God is just blessing. And that just bends us so far out of shape that we're useless. We're worthless. We spend so much of our life looking at everybody else. We live in a society that encourages us. Face, Facebook and Instagram and all of it. It's, it's, it's been so detrimental In closing, I think about Luke 15, the prodigal son. He goes out, he wastes his living, he lives righteously. There's a boy who stays at home. He's a good, good boy, does what he's supposed to. Boy that blew everything, comes home, and they throw a party, and the, the boy who stayed at home, the good boy, he's been out of shape. He's ticked. And Jesus tells a story, he says that the father says to the son in Luke 15, it was meet, it was appropriate, that we should make merry, we should celebrate, and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. I, I love those words, we had to make merry, we had, we had to celebrate this. Some of us were so cynical and we're so critical, and we, we envy not just the possessions of others, but we envy the mercy that is shown to them. We wish that they had gotten justice when God gives them mercy. If you're going to deal with envy, you've got to learn to celebrate others. And the heart of envy is the lie that God owes you. God doesn't owe you anything. And as a matter of fact, he paid a debt that you owed. My prayer is that our church would become a place where we celebrate each other. And that we would be free from petty things that will distract us. As some of us look at the story of Joseph, and we just say, Man, I, I, want, I want the robe. The, this whole story would have been different if I just had the robe. And maybe, maybe we should all get robes. All right. <laughs> we just all need to have robes. If the father had been a good father, everybody would have a robe. I don't know when it was in your life that you figured it out. For me, it was like 12, but life isn't fair. And we are doing ourselves no favors by trying to think to ourselves that it ought to be. Some of us exhaust our lives trying to, trying to make everything fair. Some of us as parents, we do our best to just make everything fair for our child. You're setting your child up for failure if you try to make everything fair for your child. Let me just help you there. Because they're going to get out into life, and you're not going to be there to coddle them and they're going to be out in life, and, and, and they're going to be faced with stuff, and it's going to be like, uh, yeah, about that. So I've raised you for 18 years to believe that I was going to make everything better, but I can't fix this one. <laughs> have fun. Call me when you have grandkids, right? Life's not fair. We've got to start looking at life as this. Life... Every blessing that we have is just by the goodness of God. Every blessing we have is simply by the goodness of God. And some of us need to stop living for the robe in Genesis 37. And we need to start living for the robe in Revelation 3. That white robe, the salvation that we'll once have as children of God. That, that eternal, eternal salvation... See, some of us, we are so worried and bent out of shape about missing out on the Genesis 37 robe, the life and the favor and the prosperity and the attention. We're so much living for that that we forget that we are here temporarily, but we will live there eternally. Hey, listen, you missed out on Genesis 37 robe? Not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. And if you waste the rest of your life worrying about that, you're going to live a miserable, listen to me, a miserable, a miserable, a miserable, keep up with the Joneses, an exhausting, never satisfied life. And you're going to get to the end of this thing, and you're going to wonder why you didn't get more. 
Why? Because you envied everything along the way. God, I pray that you would help us. I, I know for a fact that this is exactly, exactly what you put on my heart. And God, I know that uh, a lot of times we come to church and we feel like we got to put on and we got to, we got to make ourselves look good, but we're all broken. We're the, we're the as-is section of the department store, the clearance. You walk in there and things are broken. They have an arm snapped off of this or the label's half ripped off. We're, we're broken. Our envy, our jealousy, our greed, our temper, all of that, we're broken. And Father, I pray that you just help each of us just to be honest with ourselves and honest with you this morning that we don't have to come and try to put on and try to pretend like we're all good because you, God, know our hearts and we're not fooling you. And God, some of us spend our whole lives trying to pretend, pretending that we don't care, pretending that everything's gravy, pretending like we don't have envy, we don't have anger, we are pretending our way through life, and we are going to be so embarrassed when we stand before you. And so, God, I pray that you'd help us just to be honest with ourselves today. I pray that you'd help us to identify our sin where it's at and deal with it and deal with it. I pray that we'd empty ourselves of our pride and that we'd be honest and candid with you this morning. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, would you stand to your feet?